Wednesday, December 8th, President Biden says today that he warned Russian President Vladimir Putin that Moscow will face serious economic pain if it tries to attack Ukraine, but promises prospective talks to address Russia's concerns about NATO's expansion. Biden said he was very straightforward with Putin during their call yesterday, warning the Russian leader that he will pay a heavy price if he invades Ukraine. Preliminary results indicating that the current COVID vaccines holding up reasonably well against the new Omicron variant of the pathogen. The Senate approves a resolution to overturn the Biden administration's requirement that businesses with 100 or more workers have their employees be vaccinated against the coronavirus or submit to weekly testing. The Democratic-led House of Representatives unlikely to even take the measure up. Key Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia says he'll vote to uphold the Senate parliamentarian's decision if she rules that immigration or other provisions should fall from the Democrats' huge social and environmental legislation, the Build Back Better bill. Former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows sues the House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection as the chair of the panel pledges to file contempt charges against him now that Meadows is no longer complying with a subpoena. And a House of Representatives subcommittee looks into the reports of an international web of secret financial trusts used by billionaires and powerful government officials to hide money and evade taxes. From Pacifica Radio, KBFA in Berkeley, KBFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. President Joe Biden said today that he warned Russian President Vladimir Putin that Moscow will face a severe economic pain if it tries to attack Ukraine. But Biden promised prospective talks to address Russia's concerns about NATO's expansion. Biden said he was very straightforward with Putin during their two-and-a-half-hour call yesterday, warning the Russian leader that he will pay a heavy price if he invades Ukraine. If, in fact, he invades Ukraine, there will be severe consequences, economic consequences like none he's ever seen or ever have been seen. No minced words, said Biden, as he departed the White House for Kansas City. Asked by reporters if he'd ruled out U.S. troops on the ground to stop Russia, Biden says that's not even on the table, saying that a U.S. obligation to protect NATO allies if they come under attack doesn't extend to Ukraine, which is not in the Atlantic Military Alliance, NATO. At the same time, he said that the U.S its allies, and Russia could sit down for talks to discuss Moscow's grievances about NATO's expansion. Biden said that by the end of the week, he hopes to announce meetings at a higher level with at least four of the U.S.'s major NATO allies and Russia to discuss the future of Russia's concerns relative to NATO and whether accommodations could be made to bring down the temperature on the Eastern Front in Ukraine. Putin, for his part, promised that Moscow will submit its proposals for a security dialogue with the U.S. in a few days. He reaffirmed his denial of planning to attack Ukraine, but said that Moscow can't remain indifferent to NATO's possible expansion to its neighbor. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison have both said their countries will join the U.S. in a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Games over human rights concerns. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also said today that Canada will join the diplomatic boycott of the Winter Olympic Games over human rights concerns. As a country, indeed, as many partners around the world, we are extremely concerned 
by the repeated human rights violations uh, by the Chinese government. That is why uh, we are announcing today that we will not be sending any diplomatic representation to the Beijing Olympic or Paralympic Games this winter. Our athletes have been training for years and are looking forward to compete at the highest level against athletes from around the world, and they will continue to have all of our fullest support. Reporter Patrick Falk has more from Beijing, China. Several are yet to commit, but it seems it could be just a matter of time before the U.S.'s allies join in on a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Games to protest against China's human rights record. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the decision was made because Australia hadn't been able to reopen diplomatic channels with Beijing even to discuss human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Relations between the two countries remain tense over the origins of COVID-19 and trade. On Tuesday, China warned the U.S. will pay the price for its decision and warned of resolute countermeasures. It's not said what action it might take. Patrick Falk, Beijing. Preliminary laboratory results came in today from scientists in South Africa and Germany that appear to show that the current two-dose regimen of vaccines are less effective against preventing infection from the new Omicron variant of the coronavirus, but are still effective at preventing serious illness. The studies also show that a third booster dose will recover much of the effectiveness. The news comes on the same day that Pfizer announced results from its own study showing the vaccine provides some protection and even more with a booster. Chief Pfizer scientist Mikhail Dolsten spoke with CNN this morning. Everyone should get vaccinated and those that have given the two doses should uh, as soon as possible get the third dose. The South African study found that even if there are more breakthrough infections after two doses of vaccine, most experts believe the vaccines will still work against the Omicron variant because of the other immune defenses the vaccines trigger. The studies haven't yet been scientifically reviewed. Canada's first homegrown COVID-19 vaccine has shown high efficacy against infection during phase three clinical trials. That's according to the drug makers behind the plant-based shot. They reported on the results of the trials yesterday in the hope for official approval for their use. Medicago, a biopharmaceutical company in Quebec City, and British American vaccine giant GlaxoSmithKline are now preparing their final regulatory submission to Health Canada. The company said in a news release that the vaccine's overall efficacy rate against all virus variants studied was 71%, with a higher efficacy rate of 75% against COVID-19 infections of any severity from the dominant Delta variant. The company's medical officer told the CBC that if licensed, the shot would be the first COVID-19 vaccine using virus-like particle technology and the first plant-based vaccine ever approved for human use. The shots use Metacognos plant-derived virus-like particles, which resemble the coronavirus behind COVID-19, but don't contain its genetic material. And it also contains an adjuvant, a substance that increases the body's immune response to an antigen. That's from GSK to help boost the vaccine's effectiveness. Nearly 500 employees of the Los Angeles Unified School District have been fired this week for refusing to comply with a mandate that they get vaccinated against COVID-19. While at the same time, some 34,000 students have not yet been vaccinated as required. The school board voted 7 to nothing in separate motions to terminate the employees who make up less than 1% of the district's approximately 73,000 workers. Meanwhile, with thousands of students not yet complying with the mandate, there's no longer enough time for kids who have not gotten their first shot to be fully inoculated by the January 10th start of the second semester. 
Students who are not fully vaccinated or exempt will be forced into the district's independent study program or will have to leave the Los Angeles public school system. The United States Senate today passed a resolution to overturn President Biden's vaccine mandate that businesses with 100 or more workers require their employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19 or to submit to weekly testing. The resolution passed 52 to 48. Two Democrats had indicated they would support the measure. Joe Manchin of West Virginia, John Tester of Montana. Some Republicans said they're supportive of the vaccine, but the mandate to vaccinate amounts to government overreach. They said it may even contribute to people not getting vaccinated at all. Utah Republican Mike Lee. I'm very, very much against these mandates. I am for the vaccines. I've been vaccinated. My family's been vaccinated. I've encouraged people everywhere to get vaccinated. But when someone chooses not to be vaccinated for whatever reason, whether it's a medical reason or religious reason, a reason related to personal belief or due to a specific concern about a specific reaction they've had to something else, it's still their decision. It still doesn't warrant uh, the, the overpowering hand of the federal government coming in and threatening to face to, to, to force their employers to fire them under the threat of crippling penalties. The vast majority of Democrats voted against the resolution to block the vaccine mandate. Senate leader Democrat Chuck Schumer of New York said Americans who have refused to get vaccinated are the biggest impediment to ending the pandemic, saying resistance to mandated vaccines is misguided based on politics. Some of the anti-vaxxers here in this chamber remind me of what happened 400 years ago when people were clinging to the fact that the sun revolved around the earth. They just didn't believe science. Or 300 years ago when they were sure, or 500 years ago when they were sure the earth was flat. It's just like that. The science is here. And what does the science show? The more people get vaccinated, the greater chance we have to eliminate or and certainly greatly reduce the virulence of this disease. And people are resisting. It's wrong and it's bad for the country. And it's not based on any scientific evidence whatsoever. The resolution now heads to the House of Representatives where it's unlikely to garner enough support for passage, even if it does make it to the House floor for a vote. That means the mandate would stand, although the courts have put it on hold for now. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced tighter restrictions today to stem the spread of the Omicron variant, urging people in England to again work from home and mandating COVID-19 passes for entrance into nightclubs and large events. Johnson said it's time to impose stricter measures to prevent a spike of hospitalizations and deaths as the new coronavirus variant spreads rapidly in the community. We will reintroduce the guidance to work from home. Employers should use the rest of the week to discuss working arrangements with their employees. But from Monday, you should work from home if you can. Go to work if you must, but work from home if you can. All right. I know this will be hard uh, for, uh, for many people, but by reducing your contacts in the workplace, you will help slow transmission. Johnson said 568 cases of the Omicron variant have been confirmed so far across the UK. And he said the true number is certain to be much higher. He said that while there wasn't yet comprehensive data on how dangerous Omicron is, rising hospitalization rates in South Africa, where the variant was first detected, suggested it has the potential to cause real harm. The British government reported another 51,342 confirmed daily cases of COVID-19 as of today, with 161 more people dying. Overall, Britain has seen over 146,000 deaths in the pandemic, the second worst deaths toll in Europe after Russia.
Kentucky lawmakers have heard from the states. Nurses, firefighters, truck drivers, grocery store employees, and other essential workers this week. And the first of two public hearings on how to distribute essential worker bonus pay. Nadia Ramlagan reports. Governor Andy Bashir has said he wants to use $400 million in federal aid. Out of more than $2 billion, the state is expected to receive an American Rescue Plan Act funds. Democratic State Representative Joni Jenkins of Louisville says workers' input on how the coronavirus impacted their profession will be considered by a special work group as lawmakers debate how to divvy up the funding. The work group will be issuing recommendations to the governor about how to how to use this money and maybe part of his budget bill or maybe a standalone bill when we go back into session in January. According to the Kentucky Center for Statistics, more than three quarters of the state's residents, 1.4 million people are employed in critical occupations. That's the third highest in the nation behind Mississippi and Indiana. Federal rules issued by the Treasury Department allow states to provide bonus pay up to an additional $13 per hour, in addition to a person's regular pay, without exceeding $25,000 per eligible employee. Democratic State Representative Buddy Wheatley of Covington explains that bonus pay is available specifically to frontline workers who couldn't work remotely and who faced health risks due to the nature of their profession. All of these groups will have an opportunity to say what they want and we're, we're not going to be able to get everybody to testify, but we have left open the availability of written testimony. He says written comments will be accepted through the end of December. Anyone who wants to testify or submit input in writing can contact Shelley Hayden in the Kentucky House Democratic Caucus office at shelley.hayden at lrc.ky.gov. This is Nadia Ramlagan for Kentucky News Connection. And this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. And the radio station to which you are listening right now for the Evening News is now in day two of its year-end holiday fun drive. Dedicated to the proposition that we ought to stay on the air into the new year, that we ought to survive until 2022. Thus, we're attempting to raise the money that we need to actually do that. We are asking you, if you are not already a financial supporter of this listener-sponsored station, to become one and if Perhaps you're already a contributor to consider a year-end gift. If you are listening in Southern California, the way you go about this is by dialing 818-985-5735. That's KBFK in Los Angeles, 818-985-5735. Or you can go online at kpfk.org, KPFK. Org. If you are listening in the Central Valley or in Northern California, perhaps you're listening to KFCF in Fresno or KPFA in Berkeley, one of the two, or one of our repeater stations, call us at KPFA at 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. Now, if you were dedicated enough to try to do this on our first day yesterday and the phone line wasn't functioning for you, thanks for doing that. But now the phone line is fixed, so you can reach us at 1-800-439-5732. one 800 Four three nine five seven three two, or go online kpfa.org kpfa.org and perhaps it was because the phone lines were screwed up yesterday that we were unable to make our goal yesterday. We had a goal of generating 20 financial contributions, 20 donations, 20 individuals making a contribution, a listener-sponsored gift to keep this radio station on the air and we we fell woefully short we raised uh we got about one third of that total to make a donation so we're hoping to make it up tonight 
Maybe because the phones are fixed, we can do it. Four people have called or gone online, contributed thus far. So we've only got 16 left to go. 1-800-439-5732, the number to call in Northern and Central California or online at kpfa.org. 818-985-5735 or kpfk.org online in Southern California. President Joe Biden signed an executive order today to make the federal government carbon neutral by the year 2050. Requires a 65% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. And that the U.S. fleet of cars and trucks become all electric by the year 2035. Biden traveled to Missouri to promote his Build Back Better vision and outline what the already passed bipartisan infrastructure bill that he signed into law will do for middle America. Christina Onestead reports. President Joe Biden has a new slogan for his $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure deal that he signed into law last month, Building a Better America. It brings a traditional infrastructure deal closer in moniker to his Build Back Better plan that's still pending in the Senate. He promoted both back-to-back in Missouri. We're in a situation where we've known that our infrastructure had problems for a long, long time. I don't think I could take one more phrase that's going to be infrastructure weak. But guess what? It's going to be infrastructure decade now, man. No more talking. Action. We'll also include the most significant investment in passenger rail in 50 years. $66 billion dollars. For passenger and freight rail. Biden lost Kansas and Missouri in last year's presidential election. But his visit to Kansas City, Missouri is a chance to make inroads with voters by showing his administration can deliver results. Missouri has nearly 2,200 bridges and more than 7,500 miles of highway deemed in poor condition, needing upgrades. Under the bipartisan infrastructure deal, Missouri could expect $7 billion for highways and bridges, a nearly 30 percent increase in federal funding according to the white house we built america and we've left behind so much for so long we're going to help rebuild the economy this time from the bottom up in the middle out you know a blue collar this bill is a blue collar blueprint for working americans 95 percent of the jobs created in the infrastructure bill don't require a college education the only way this works is blue-collar Americans do the building. And the only way it ever worked, we're going to do it again. Mark my words, we're going to do this again. In a spirit of bipartisanship, Biden paid homage to the late Republican Bob Dole and noted he's responsible for an infusion of electric public transportation in Kansas City. He also signed an executive order flexing the government's purchasing power, requiring it to have an all-electric fleet of cars and trucks by the year 2035 and for federal agencies to be carbon neutral by 2050. Agencies will have to prove a 65% reduction in planet warming greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Speaking at the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, Biden also promoted Build Back Better. Elder care, housing, meeting the moment of climate change. That's what this plan does. All in, study found that my plan would mean the equivalent of $7,400 in tax cuts and savings for the typical family of four with two kids. And guess what? Well, what I proposed is in a way to lower some of the difficult costs families have to pay every month by asking corporations and the wealthiest Americans to pay their fair share for change. Look, right now, everybody talks about the price tag for this legislation. A trillion seven hundred and fifty billion dollars. It will not cost the taxpayers a penny. If you're making less than four hundred grand a year, you're not gonna have your taxes go up one single penny. 
The plan is by tying both bills more closely together, they can win broader approval. To that end, the White House also launched a website asking people to record videos about how the infrastructure spending will help their own communities. Part of a search for grassroots support as the administration seeks greater recognition for its achievements ahead of the 2020 midterm elections. I'm Christina Onestead reporting for KPFA. Pivotal Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia said today he'd vote to uphold the Senate parliamentarian's decision if she rules that immigration or other provisions should fall from the Democrats' huge social and environment bill, the Build Back Better bill, underscoring the party's uphill fight to keep some top priorities in the legislation. Elizabeth McDonough, the chamber's nonpartisan rules referee, is expected to decide shortly whether language letting millions of immigrants remain temporarily in the U.S. can stay in the 10-year roughly $2 trillion measure. She's also considering the fate of other initiatives, including parts of Democrats' plan to curb pharmaceutical prices. McDonough's decisions can be ignored by whichever Democrat is presiding over the chamber during the debate, but Republicans could force votes challenging that. Ultimately, Democrats would likely need all their votes to defeat such Republican moves in the 50-50 chamber where Vice President Kamala Harris can break ties. All Republicans oppose the legislation. Manchin of West Virginia spent months forcing Democrats to reduce the size and the scope of their legislation, which the House approved last month. The Senate is all but certain to make significant changes to the bill, one of President Biden's top domestic priorities. Party leaders are hoping Congress can approve a final version by Christmas. Like most of the nation, Wisconsin does not have a statewide paid parental leave policy. But in Milwaukee, a three-month paid parental leave policy is being proposed for city government employees. Jonah Chester has that story. The city of Milwaukee doesn't currently offer paid parental leave for its workers. Milwaukee Alder Marina Dmitrievich says if adopted, her proposal would provide long-term benefits for children. When they're at home, the babies with their family members, um, we know breastfeeding rates increase, infant mortality can decrease. The bonding increases, and it's a best start possible. The proposal comes as federal lawmakers debate a similar measure in the Build Back Better framework. In recent weeks, that provision has been slashed from three months of paid leave to one. A 2018 report from the Partnership for Women and Families found a national paid parental leave policy of three months would result in at least 600 fewer infant deaths annually. According to the Bipartisan Policy Center, only nine states and the District of Columbia have adopted statewide parental leave policies. Dmitrievich says her proposal could make Milwaukee's one of the most generous such programs in Wisconsin. We know there's employee and labor shortages across the nation, and I think this will make a great place for talent and recruitment and diversity and inclusion. Jennifer Morales with the organization Family Values at Work says activists have been pushing to expand paid parental leave in the state for decades. She knows Wisconsin was a leader in establishing unpaid parental leave in the 1990s. Families need this. We need this for our health. We need this for our um, economic stability and to end poverty and so many great benefits for families. The three-month proposal was introduced to Milwaukee City Council last month. It's making its way through the committee process and is expected to be before the city's finance committee in January. For the Wisconsin News Connection, I'm Jonah Chester. And this is the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online, kpfa.org. It's a one-hour newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock. There's a half-hour edition on the weekends. All our newscasts archived online, kpfa.org. I'm Mark Merkel. We're about halfway through the program, and we're about halfway towards our goal, our financial goal for the evening, which is to persuade, cajole, fool, <laughs> at least 20 of you to make a donation, a contribution to support this listener-sponsored station because we don't have any 
commercials. We don't air any commercials. We don't have any corporate underwriters. We don't have any rich people foot in the bill. We're not sponsored by any religious institution, any political institution, any foundation of any kind, and we don't have any state or federal money. Yeah, that leaves just you, our listeners, to keep us on the air. That makes us independent of most of the commercial forces in a modern capitalist society, which I would submit is a good way to be if, if you're able to raise enough money from the people listening to the programs that you produce to keep producing them. And so that's what this is all about. This is the holiday fun drive, the end of the year fun drive for KPFA and KPFK. So we are beseeching your financial support. If you are listening in Southern California, the phone number is 818-985-5735 or online at kpfk.org. If you are listening in Northern and Central California, the number to call is one 800 439 Five seven three two or kpfa.org. Thanks to Kimball in Berkeley and Craig in San Francisco for your financial support tonight and a plethora of anonymous contributors, people who didn't want to be thanked by name on air, but I can tell you they're from Belmont, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, San Jose, Mountain View, and Forestville. Thanks to all of you. Please join them. We're looking for at least Ten more donors tonight in Southern California, 818-985-5735 or online at kpfk.org. In Northern California, 1-800-439-5732, also for Central California, that works, and kpfa.org. Lawmakers in Washington are taking a look at secretive tax havens used to hide money in places like Switzerland and the Cayman Islands, but now increasingly even in states like South Dakota. The hearing comes after an October report by investigative journalists called the Pandora Papers. Christopher Martinez reports. When the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists released its report on tax havens and financial secrecy in October, it sparked a wave of outrage, denials from some of the people named, and vows to investigate from some government officials. Oxfam International responded by saying, this is where our missing hospitals are, adding that tax havens cost the world more than four and a quarter trillion dollars each year. Now a House subcommittee is looking into those reports on an international web of secret trusts. Democrat Bill Pasquel of New Jersey is chair of the House Ways and Means Oversight Committee. This uh, blockbuster investigation vividly demonstrates how the ultra-wealthy and powerful live under a different set of rules than everyone else. He says there have long been alarms about hidden bank accounts in Switzerland, but assets are now being hidden right here. One need not go to Switzerland. It's a nice place, but you don't have to go there to hide your money. We'll make it easier for you. We need to ask ourselves, do we want America to stand for fairness or be just another spot for rich folks to bury treasure? His concerns were not shared by all of the committee members. I would tell you, if this wasn't for a double standard in Washington, there'd be no standard at all. Republican Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania is the ranking Republican on the committee. It seems that this hearing will be another example of the hypocrisy coming forth from the other side. On one hand, Democrats are pushing for massive tax cuts for millionaires through changes to the salt cap. While on the other hand, they claim to be going after the hidden wealth of foreign nationals. Tax the rich one day, cut taxes for the rich the next. It can be hard to keep up around here. The Pandora Papers found the money-hiding schemes go way beyond the old Swiss banks, and they're growing not only abroad, but in some U.S. states like South Dakota. The committee invited South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem to testify, but she declined. Daniel Hamill is a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. He says when it comes to tax evasion, countries can be a place of origin, an intermediary to hide the money, or a destination. And the U.S., he says, is all three, but increasingly the last. The U.S. is the world's leading investment destination for offshore wealth. 
Our laws enable foreigners through offshore intermediaries to invest anonymously in the U.S. and to grow their wealth tax-free. We are, in this respect, the world's ultimate tax haven. Arika Hanachak is with the FACT Coalition. She says it's important to deny safe haven to tax evaders, drug traffickers, human rights abusers, kleptocrats, terrorists, and sanctions dodgers. The U.S. has become one of the most secretive jurisdictions in the world. This undesirable status harms average Americans, undermines our national security, weakens democracy, and erodes our tax base, and that of countries around the world. The Pandora Papers opened the world's eyes to the insidious effects of this secrecy. Political elites, criminals, and adversaries exploit offshore financial systems that are not offshore at all, but rather nurtured in the United States, in our own backyard. There is, of course, another point of view. David Burton is with the Heritage Foundation. He blasted a recent law aimed at cutting abuse, along with other criticisms. We should be under no illusion whether personal and financial privacy are inextricably linked. A government, or a private organization for that matter, that knows everything about our financial life will know virtually everything about our private life, including our business, political, social, and religious associations and inclinations, what we buy, what we own, where we travel, and more. Ever-increasing surveillance and mandatory reporting endanger the freedom of the American people. Democrat Pasquale says he looks forward to working with the Biden administration to tackle the issue, because without action, he says, the problem will only grow. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows today sued the House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection as the chair of the panel pledged to move forward with contempt charges now that Meadows is no longer complying with the subpoena. It's a remarkable turnaround from last week when Meadows had declared his intention of cooperating with the committee on certain areas of their inquiry. His lawsuit, filed in federal court in Washington, asks a judge to invalidate two subpoenas that he says are overly broad and unduly burdensome. It accuses the committee of overreaching by issuing a subpoena to Verizon for his cell phone records. The complaint was filed hours after Democratic Representative Benny Thompson, the committee chair, (coughs) declared he had no choice but to proceed with contempt charges against Meadows. Meadows did not show up for today's scheduled deposition after his lawyer, George Terwilliger, told the committee his client was ending his cooperation. But Thompson noted Meadows has already provided documents to the committee, including personal emails and texts about President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn his 2020 election defeat. And has also published a book released this week that discusses the January 6th attack. That he would sell his telling of the facts of that day while denying a congressional committee the opportunity to ask him about the attack on our Capitol marks an historic and aggressive defiance of Congress, Representative Thompson said in a letter to Meadows' attorney, Terwilliger. The move to hold Meadows in contempt comes as the committee has struggled to gain compliance from a few of the former president's closest and most high-profile allies. Still, the committee has already conducted more than 250 interviews with witnesses about the assault. Committee leaders have said they intend to punish anyone who will not comply, and the House has already voted to hold longtime Trump ally Steve Bannon in contempt. After he defied their subpoena, the Justice Department later indicted Bannon on two counts. The documents Meadows has provided, Thompson wrote, include communications from around the time of the presidential election in November and before the insurrection and involve White House efforts to overturn Biden's election victory. Biden said Meadows provided the committee last month with personal emails and backed-up data from his personal cell phone, including text messages. The documents Meadows turned over included an email dated November 7th, 2020, the day Biden was declared the White House winner, the Thompson described as discussing the appointment of alternate slates of electors as part of a direct and collateral attack after the election. Thompson did not say who sent the email or give further details. A November 6, 2020 
text exchange between Meadows and an unidentified member of Congress, Thompson wrote, was apparently about appointing alternate electors in certain states as part of a plan that the member acknowledged would be <clears throat> highly controversial, and to which Mr. Meadows apparently said, quote, I love it. Progressive Democrats are ratcheting up pressure on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to censure right-wing Republican Lauren Boebert of Colorado for her recent comments, likening a Muslim member of Congress, Democrat Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, to a bomb-carrying terrorist. Massachusetts House Democrat Ianna Presley introduced a resolution today with a dozen other progressives that would strip Congresswoman Boebert of her committee assignments. Presley says a failure to act would make Democrats complicit in Islamophobia. We stand in solidarity with Representative Omar and our Muslim colleagues who for too long have been targets of unprecedented hate and vitriol. For a member of Congress to repeatedly and unapologetically use hateful, racist, and Islamophobic tropes towards a Muslim colleague is dangerous. This sort of toxic behavior has no place in the halls of Congress, and it diminishes the honor of the institution that we all serve in. It has no place in our public discourse. It has no place in our society. It has no place in any workplace, period. Pelosi has urged restraint. She says punishing Bobert would give her the attentions that she wants. Yet Pelosi and House Democrats did move to censure Republican Paul Gosar of Arizona last month for sharing a video on social media showing him stabbing a Democrat in the back and then going after President Biden. Boebert today dismissed the news conference as a non-event. The Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing on the closure of Guantanamo Bay Prison yesterday. 39 prisoners remain indefinitely detained there, 13 of them without even any charges, 20 years after the December, uh, September 11th attacks. Colleen Kelly, a co-founder of 9-11 Families for Peaceful Tomorrows, lost her brother in the September 11th attack and says the situation and conditions at Guantanamo Bay Prison undermine her group's quest for justice. Five men in Guantanamo stand accused of planning and supporting the 9-11 attacks. A trial has not begun. Instead, we have heard nine and a half years of argument in pre-trial hearings. And instead of learning how and why the attacks that killed our family members were carried out, we have listened to seemingly endless litigation largely concerned with obtaining classified information about the defendant's torture. That sentiment was shared with Democrats who note torture used against detainees has put any confessions or charges against them in limbo. For Kelly, who's been waiting 20 years for justice and has seen members of her group die before seeing any justice for their slain loved ones, time is running out. She's calling on Congress to pass a resolution calling for the closure of Guantanamo Bay and for authorities to offer plea deals of guilty with the five men charged with the attacks who are still being detained at the prison. I'm asking this commission to acknowledge that the military commissions have failed and to help us gain some form of resolution through plea agreements in the 9-11 case. We understand that in exchange for guilty pleas, the government would likely drop the death penalty. What we would hope to finally get, however, is answers to our questions about 9-11, information we've been denied for two decades. Some may not see this as justice. Indeed, it is not the outcome that our organization advocated for at our founding, but it is a way forward. Perhaps then this long festering collective national wound can finally begin to heal. Republicans and their panelists called Guantanamo a necessary evil to be used against terrorists that still seek to hurt the United States. It costs about $40 million a year. That's more than $1 million to imprison each detainee at Guantanamo Bay yearly. California Attorney General 
Rob Bonta announced today a $3.5 million judgment against a Los Angeles real estate investment company for unlawfully evicting tenants from foreclosed properties. Wedgwood is a prominent player in residential foreclosures in California, buying, refurbishing, and selling foreclosed properties at a profit. According to Attorney General Bonta, in order to resell its properties quickly, Wedgwood removes existing tenants, having used a variety of unlawful and harassing tactics to do so. That's why Bonta fined them $3.5 million, $2.7 million, going to tenants that the company wrongfully evicted, says Bonta. There are some who pursue profits over the interest of families and worse profits over the law. When you break the law, you will be held to account. There will be consequences. And today, I'm here to announce a $3.5 million judgment against a Los Angeles County-based real estate investment company, Wedgwood, for unlawfully evicting tenants from foreclosed properties. The terms of this judgment will serve as a model for this industry. Wedgwood flips foreclosed homes. The company is alleged to have engaged in a variety of unlawful tactics, including depriving lawful tenants of their right to continue living on the property under a pre-existing lease or for at least 90 days after foreclosure, as provided under state and federal law. Evicting tenants without just cause in rent-controlled jurisdictions, filing false declarations to support its unlawful evictions, and failing to provide essential utility services to tenants. Ponta says the judgment also reforms Wedgwood's practices, putting other real estate speculators on notice that the state will prosecute those who seek to exploit foreclosed homeowners. Reforms also include ensuring evictions don't violate just cause measures, training employees about tenants' rights. Bonta says the judgment still subject to court approval. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Thirteen donors thus far during our news hour. We have 13 minutes left in the newscast. That's two minutes for each person that we still need to get to become a financial supporter for this listener-sponsored station. To keep this newscast on the air, to keep this radio station that airs this newscast on the air into the new year here in the Year-end fund drive, the holiday fund drive here at KPFA and KPFK in Los Angeles. Thanks to Alan in Berkeley and an, a San Leandro listener who did not want to be thanked by name on the air. Thank you. That brought us up to 13 contributors, seven to go to reach our goal of 20 contributors during the news hour. <coughs> Excuse me. If you are listening, Southern California, you go to kpfk.org, which is where your ears are. KPFK in Los Angeles, kpfk.org, or call 818-985-5735, 818-985-5735. If you're listening in Central Northern California, the number to call one 800 439 Five seven three two one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two, or go to KPFA's website, kpfa.org.
The Seattle Times reports that the effort to recall Seattle Council Member Kashama Sawant has lost significant ground in today's ballot count, with 50.3% of counted voters agreeing to remove her from office. The election was yesterday, with the recall campaign netting 53% of the votes counted that day, yesterday. But with today's count, Sawant has narrowed the difference to only 246 votes. Sawant, a socialist, represents the city council district considered Seattle's most liberal and includes the neighborhoods east of the downtown area. <coughs> if Sawant is recalled, the other eight council members would appoint a replacement until a special election next November. Swant, an Indian immigrant and an economics professor, is the longest tenured council member in Seattle. If she survives, the recall would boost the city's beleaguered left wing, which was bruised during last month's general election when business-oriented candidates won the mayor's office and a council seat. So Want has had a big influence on Seattle politics since she launched her political career under the banner of the Socialist Alternative Party in 2012 when she ran unsuccessfully for state representative. She was elected to the city council the following year, and her threat to run a voter initiative drive for an immediate $15 an hour minimum wage has been credited with pressuring business leaders and then-Mayor Ed Murray to reach a deal raising the wage to $15 over several years. Seattle was the first major city in the United States to adopt such a measure. Savant has pushed for rent control, police funding cuts, and increased taxes for corporations like Amazon to pay for affordable housing, schools, and services. The head of a Senate panel examining social media's negative effects on young people dismissed as a public relations tactic some safety measures announced by Facebook's popular Instagram platform. Adam Mosseri, the head of Instagram, faced lawmakers at a hearing today with senators angry over revelations of how the photo-sharing platform can harm some young users. The lawmakers are demanding the company commit to making changes. Under sharp questioning by senators of both party, Mosseri defended the company's conduct and the efficacy of its new safety measures. He challenged the assertion that Instagram has been shown to be addictive for young people. Facebook's parent company Meta has announced a new ban on postings linked to Myanmar's military to include all pages, groups, and accounts representing military-controlled businesses. It had already banned advertising from such businesses in February. That action, which also banned military and military-controlled state and media entities from Facebook and Instagram, came after the army seized power from the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. The new action came just a day after a high-profile lawsuit was filed in California against Facebook parent meta platforms, seeking over a hundred. $50 billion over the company's alleged failure to stop hateful posts inciting violence against the Muslim Rohingya minority by Myanmar's military and its supporters. Reporter Rachel, Rachel Silverman has more. Facebook says it's now banning all Myanmar military controlled businesses from having a presence on its platforms. In February, it banned all entities linked to the Myanmar military from advertising on its platforms. Facebook says it's taking the action based on extensive documentation, including a UN fact finding report that the businesses have a direct role in funding the Myanmar military. Rachel Silverman, San Francisco. <laughs> California state lawmakers may help pay for people from other states to come to California for abortions if the U.S. Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. A report released today by dozens of abortion providers and advocacy groups asked state policymakers to pay for such things as travel, lodging, and child care for those coming to California from other states. The report also asked lawmakers to reimburse abortion providers for procedures performed for patients who can't afford them. 
That includes patients who travel from other states that would otherwise qualify for the state's Medicaid programs. Report has the support of top legislative leaders and Governor Gavin Newsom. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court appears ready to rule that religious schools can't be excluded from a main program that offers tuition aid for private education. The court's six conservative justices seemed largely unpersuaded after nearly two hours in the courtroom today by Maine's arguments that the state is willing to pay for the rough equivalent of a public education but not religious inculcation. The court's three liberal justices signaled they were more aligned with the state's arguments. The case is the latest test of religious privileges for a Supreme Court that's favored religious-based discrimination claims. Olaf Scholz was sworn in today in the German parliament as the country's new chancellor. I swear that I will dedicate my efforts to the well-being of the German people, promote their welfare, protect them from harm, uphold and defend the basic law and the law. Scholz heads the center-left Social Democrats. He replaces center-right leader Angela Merkel, who steps away as head of the largest economy in Europe after 16 years in office. Scholz says he hopes to modernize Germany, combat climate change, and tackle the coronavirus pandemic. Lawmakers voted by 395 to 303 with six abstentions. Tensions to elect Schultz today. Schultz heads a coalition of three parties which are portraying the combination of former rivals as a progressive alliance that includes the progressive Greens and the libertarian Free Democrats. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his Conservative Party have come under fire over an alleged Christmas party that was supposed to have happened last year while the rest of the country was in lockdown. The controversy broke after release of a video in which high-ranking conservative party members are shown joking about the party. Laura Macon Isherwood reports from London. It's not clear who leaked this video, but what it captures places mounting pressure on the UK government. The Prime Minister's then spokesperson, Allegra Stratton, pictured standing at the podium inside Downing Street's new press room, practising answering questions from government aides posing as journalists. One asks whether Ms Stratton recognises reports of a party taking place inside Downing Street, jokes are made about it being cheese and wine, before Ms Stratton is heard saying there was definitely no social distancing. Opposition Labour Party leader Sir Keir Starmer says it shows the Prime Minister has not been straight, urging him to come clean and apologise. Laura Macon Isherwood, London. Just a couple of minutes left in this newscast and just a couple of donors to go. We've got 18, 18 out of our 20, 20 was the goal, 20 contributors tonight to keep this listener-sponsored newscast, this listener-sponsored radio station on the air. We've got two minutes flat out to go. Won't you please give us a call at 1-800-439-5732 or online. You can do it at kpfk.org if you're listening in Southern California or you can call down there at 818-985-5735. Two, just two more contributors. 818-985-5735 in Southern California, kpfk.org or 1-800-439-5732 in Northern and Central California, kpfa.org, kpfa.org. One minute, 15 seconds to go. A father and a son have been arrested on suspicion of starting a massive California wildfire that forced tens of thousands to flee the Lake Tahoe area earlier this year. The El Dorado County District Attorney's Office said in a statement that David Scott Smith and his son, Travis Shane Smith, are accused of reckless arson in a warrant issued before formal charges are filed. The attorney for both men says reckless arson includes starting a blaze by accident, but to such a degree that it was considered reckless. The fire burned more than 300 square miles from east of Sacramento to the Nevada border, threatening ski results and other prominent recreational areas. 
Sunny skies are predicted tomorrow for the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 50s. Further inland, partly cloudy skies with highs in the mid 50s. Rain predicted for the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the low to mid 50s. Rain predicted for the Los Angeles area, highs in the mid to upper 50s. That's it for the news tonight. Thanks for listening. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle, bringing you today's native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by. And the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 